Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of arts, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art in gaming, specifically the history of gaming and a discussion on when the medium turned from just that, well, games, to very much what it is today an art form. Today, I'm joined by one of our top contributors, Mr. T. Buck, and I know he's really excited about this one because he has a lot to say on the subject. T. Buck, welcome. Hey. I'm excited. I'm excited uh, about this too. I've been I've been thinking about it ever since we 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 started talking about it. So Very good. Uh, first, of course, we need to give our listeners a little bit of background, so bear with me. So, a little history. First, the industry... My humble opinion, our humble opinions, I think the birth of the industry was really in the 70s. A lot of people could argue that it was a little before that, but I think the real success and the explosion of the industry happened with Atari's very first hit, and that is Pong in 1972, initially just an arcade cabinet. Of course, uh, Pong is a perfect example of it just being a game. It's essentially table tennis, two lines and a ball, right? Uh, we saw a little bit of the home console market open up, but it never really took off. Off, as the arcade market was really the focus at the time. We saw this with the Magnifox Odyssey, the, the earliest of the video game consoles. Uh, and there was promising growth for a long time until, of course, we saw the very first video game crash of 1977. But good news, happy ending. A, another game came along and rejuvenated the market almost overnight, and that happened in 1972, and that was with Space Invaders, an absolute classic in the gaming industry and something we all hold dear to our hearts. Now, this actually led to what is called the Golden Age uh, Video Arcade Games. Emphasis, again, on arcade games. There wasn't really an emphasis for a home market yet, but we'll get there. Now, this happened for um, the Golden Age went on for quite a while until we unfortunately saw another crash, and this happened in 19. 83 and this was due to a essentially a quantity over quality market you know they were flooding the market with games that just weren't good enough and people turned away uh almost immediately but again we have another happy ending the industry was revitalized by something that is very near and dear to both me and t-bucks hearts and that is the nintendo entertainment system now this actually launched in 1983 when we saw the main crash in the west but it didn't actually get to us and revitalize the market until 85 86 and a little into 87 depending on um different uh regions and poor uh, god when i was doing my research for this poor brazil they uh they didn't get the nes until 1993 poor bastards really? yeah oh my gosh <laughs> And uh, exactly. Uh, but as we all know, uh, with the Nintendo Inter Entertainment System, when we were first met with uh, Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, and of course, a lot of other notable hits that we'll touch a little later. And arguably from there, the industry really took off, right? We never saw a crash again. And it just kind of, God, it expanded to what we see it today, almost exponentially, now a billion dollar industry. Now, that is uh, where the history stops and where the discussion on art begins, because where it turned into art is up to debate. Um, because there's a lot of different opinions here, and that's where I am gonna shut up. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the the floor over to Mr. T. Buck and and give him kind of his spiel on where he thinks a turning point is, because he knows mine, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to hear his, because I actually, I actually don't know. So yeah, so no, I I know your answer, and and yeah, <laughs> and it's one of those I agree to disagree. I you know personally, I I look at you know I I think. What we're going to talk about when it became mainstream, I, I totally agree with that. I, th I think as an art form itself, it's been you, you can have a pretty good argument that it's been around, you know, kind of from that beginning, especially during the home console and maybe the home PC kind of uh, revolution there. Um, games I'm thinking about were like on the Commodore 64. Um, you had a lot of like and you were seeing art there already. 
like an yeah, artistic like, expression. Yeah, you could see, you know, you were limited to what you could do. And I think I think that's part of it. But some of these games that they were starting to develop and starting to really is trying to explore kind of pushing the limits of, you know, the device or, or what the, the period was, um, you could start seeing they were trying to do little things that were you know, interesting or adding in, you know, some creative creativity. So where is your landmark then? I have some landmarks. I have some dates. Where would yeah. you say, I think this is the point point in time in history that this changed? So so I'm going to say when when immersion really became kind of a big thing. And I, I'm I, this is going to be I, I don't I don't think you're going to even expect this when when I this was the first game that actually for me blew me away. And it's it's a game that you're not suspecting. It was missed. Missed. Okay. Yeah. On PC. On PC. Um, this is when One I. One of the fir- I, first of its kind, actually. Yes. Yes. You know? It was a puzzle based game, but it was story driven. It had, you know, these beautiful, uh, for the time, you know, artworks. You would basically, you clicked the Revolutionary for, for first person view games. Yeah. Right? You know, there was a couple of games before that. Um, I, I can't think of off the top of my head. I want to say it was Ultima. I think False Prophet yes, or something Ultima, like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, where you had some of these immersions, uh, immersive games. and But really, when I, you know, that was the one. I, so I think Mist came out in 93, if I'm not correct. 93. And, okay. Yeah. That's your so I like um, that, that's when I, that's when I think that's really when it became an art meeting. And I, it, what's great about you saying Mist, so I had no idea, for all the listeners out there, I had no idea that he was going to throw that at me. It's funny because it makes me think of how that specific kind of game and medium has been pushed throughout the years and the decades. Because I think of The Witness as mm, yeah. a good example of a modern day mist. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I yeah. like it. Um, it's, um, it's OK. This is another weird thing. I still have dreams about it sometimes <laughs> playing it. And that's how immersed I was when I was a kid when I first saw it. I just had never really played anything like that before. So let me ask you this then. So, okay, we're saying 1993, Miss for Mr. Buck. Um, it, did it move you emotionally? Like where, I mean, besides the obvious, we can always argue that graphics are going to be the forefront of how you could talk about ga- the gaming industry as an art form. But I think art has to be moving, right? It has to be emotional. It has to be, it can change your life in the real world. It has to move beyond just whatever medium it's at, right? Yeah. So did it do that for you? Mm, I wouldn't say exactly. I think the first... What was that what? game then? And, and, well, we're going about a year later. Okay, for, we're at 1994. For us, well, yeah, for us, I think in 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 the West, I'm not sure if it came out a little bit earlier, but I'm pretty sure you know it was Final Fantasy four. Four. Okay, yeah. so uh, actual four. So it'd be two in the West. Let me see. Final Fantasy four sixth game in a Final Fantasy series. So yeah. Yeah, it so was yeah, um, four in the normal chronology, but two in the West for a long West. time until they yeah. fixed it, right? Yeah, and fixed it, yeah. That is a fucking classic, absolutely. Final Fantasy yeah. two and three, I think arguably some of the best of that era. Yeah. Uh, which I think is a good way, a good segue to my landmark. Uh, my landmarks, and feel free to dish if you have any opinions here. I think it's a little bit of 96, 97, and 98, uh, with an emphasis on 98. And yeah. I'll tell you why. So um, I would say more of the of those three, 97, 98. So in 90, 90, 1997, we had Final Fantasy VII. Okay, that was a revolutionary yep. game for its time. Yep. We also had GoldenEye, which is arguably just a game. I just wanted to, just to mention it because I but fucking it, love it GoldenEye. really made... It really brought first person shooters to the next level. I yeah, mean, there was it, I, I think there was the birth of multiplayer like death matches. Death match. And, yeah. Death match. Yeah. And we also saw Castlevania Symphony of the Night in mm. 1997. Mm-hmm. But in 1998, I think is the landmark year for me. And that is because of Metal Gear Solid. Um, that's the very first time that I can think of in my childhood and in my entire essentially life of experiencing gaming that. It was incredibly moving because it took on a cinematic approach, you know, because yeah. movies, we can all agree movies are very much an art form, artistic, and they can bring us to tears, right? Yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say that Metal Gear Solid brought me to tears, um, but I felt something. I, 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 I felt for these characters and it seeped into my real life of how I thought about things, the world. Uh, war economies things like that um this was also the same year as uh, resident evil 2 i'm a big resi fan oh yeah 
yeah. uh, and Ocarina of Time, which is arguably the best Zelda. Yeah, I mean, oh, I totally agree with Ocarina of Time. Like, oh boy, we need to have a show on that. I, I was just going to say <laughs> Resident we, Evil Two. We will, was... we will have shows just on on game <laughs> on individual games down the road, but we needed a history episode. Yeah, no, I Resident Evil Two. The reason I want to point that out that was the first time I ever. I got scared in a game, and I don't get. And I, I'm not. Yeah, the liquors. I, yeah, I was, the the arms coming through the the window, the boarded up windows. That was the first jump scare I ever had in a video game. That that's crazy that you said that again. I did not know that going into this episode. That is exactly the exact same time in my life that was the very first jump scare in a video game as well. Yeah, I mean, it was, and it was one of those games you played at night and when it was dark, and you just like you know loaded up on some Pizza Hut. Uh, you're there with your <laughs> your, your friends, all and, nighters, surge, yeah, fucking yes. You might stay up until one. I mean, but it was it was it was okay. So it was a horror based game, but it, we also started seeing. Uh, this is more on the game side than I think on the artistic side, but we saw a strong emphasis on puzzles and adventure and things like that. And again, I think leaning more into talking about it as an art form, and we will definitely get there as um is is that it was it was there was emphasis on story narrative characters arcs and of course as human beings in our uh, modern day society we need that to connect to right exactly and um and i did i did this is the very first or the very next year 1999 i think talking about resident evil and horror i horror is i love horror i love that genre uh, and 1999 birthed Silent Hill. Mm. And that was the first time it wasn't just a jump scare. It got under my skin yeah. that I felt something. I felt eeriness. I felt uh, I, I was disturbed with the imagery, not necessarily a scarring way, just in a artistic way. There's, it's, it's hard to explain. But I think that's when we were pushing into that kind of emotional impact and that leads us to the year 2000 which we've already agreed uh, me and mr buck have already agreed that the year 2000 was is where we we really agree that it was solidifying as an art form it wasn't the birth it wasn't the beginning obviously he's more of a 1993 1994 guy i'm more of a late 90s guy when we saw that turning point but we both agree that the year 2000 is um, where it was solidifying. I I told Buck that I was gonna pick some games, and he was he had he has no idea what I picked, and we're gonna talk about them and and really discuss the art there. Um, I think some easy examples are with, of course, the Legend of Zelda just art styles. I mean, mm -hmm. you remember Cartoon Link versus Twilight's Twilight Princess Link? Oh, right? you're talking about uh, yeah yeah uh, uh, oh, Wind, Wind Waker. Waker yeah yeah. It actually still probably one of my favorite Zelda games. It's one of my least favorite. Actually. Really, I, I I love it. I, I I thought I would hate it when when it came out. I was I kind of hated it. <laughs> I'm gonna get yeah. a lot of flack for that. <laughs> Fuck it. It, it. The the art style the cell shading was really popular at that time. Um, you were starting to see a lot of games and a lot of things come out with that kind of. I, I remember there was a lot of games coming out that that had kind of that art style, and and I felt like. Nintendo was trying to get on that kind of the forefront the of the yeah I, I so here's the thing about I love that they were pushing the medium and trying different things and you have to do that that's what yeah art is all about is evolution sometimes you're not going to always it's not always at a land but you have to try that's important um at the end of the day you know the heart and soul of what i think makes a great game a great game is just that it's still a game at its heart and it, it just didn't play as well as i think pre previous titles did uh but the look of it was incredibly i think still just to give it a little bit of defense, it was still probably a little bit, I wouldn't say revolutionary for its time, but they, they were trying something different. They yeah. wanted to create something different and give it a different look. And they did. They they definitely accomplished that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I I don't know if I want to, <laughs> I have kind of a bomb game that I'm, I, I feel like you're going to be like, oh my God, yes, this is fucking art. This is, this game is art. I'm going to start with, I'm going to start earlier than 2000s. Did you ever play a game called Vagrant Story? No, I never did. Okay. Well, uh, we'll give some gym of the weeks later, but gym of the week, uh, 
in the middle of the episode, uh, listeners play Vagrant Story. It's a PlayStation One game. It's very it's it's an RPG, um, turn based, uh, in the vein of those old Final Fantasy games, but it has a strong emphasis on a comic book style. Um, it has just a cool art style in and of itself, and it's a great game. So is this another Squaresoft? I th- um, oh, I don't know off the top of my head. I want to say yes. I want to say Squaresoft uh, family. Okay. Yes. But I don't know for sure. I'll have to look it up. Maybe, maybe put that into the liner notes of the episode. Um, this was also the decade of RE4, Resident Evil 4, uh, GTA, Half-Life, um, Super Mario Galaxy. And here's where I think I'm going to drop some bombs. Let's let's go ahead and drop Shadow of the Colossus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That. Th- OK. Yeah. This is this is another. <laughs> didn't know you were going to talk about this one. Uh, this one, this one, when I played it, I, I 2005, t- w- this was 2005. Okay. The original one. Not, I mean, we, we have a remake now, but I think we have like two remakes. I think we have like a, an HD and then a remastered now or something like that. Um, but yeah, this was a, um, I, I th- this was a game that hit me emotionally that I didn't think it, it was. It's a very simple game. There, what? There's only like two or three buttons you really press. And like, it's just like boss battles, but there's, a, there's a story there and there's, there's a look to it. I think, yeah. I think let's, let's, I'm, I'm going to let you dive into the graphics. How, how is this so different than any other game of the decade? Well, the graphic, it, it, the, the thing that I, I I remember that hits me hardest is the expansiveness and just mm-hmm. kind of the simplicity of everything. Yeah, you, you're, it's a you you are riding on your horse. So so basically, you know, the premise is you're trying to save your friend, and you have to go defeat these. What is it, the colossi? It was a, it's supposed to be like a princess, right? It, 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 and there's well, it's not very clear. There's a lot of you have to talk about something artistic. It it really makes you do your homework. You have to think about what's going on. It doesn't give you it doesn't spoon feed you all of the details. Exactly. And this was this was an era when we started the OK, I get it era. Uh, what I call a video games where anytime you started playing it out or it, throughout the video game, they were giving you button hints to like do stuff. And it's like, OK, I get it. Yeah, I have to hit square i have to hit triangle during this part uh because they were trying to bring it more the medium more to, to more people but this was one of those games where yeah the story didn't really lead you anywhere and the game you know you just kind of had to figure it out so these boss battles are puzzles in themselves yeah exactly the the first one i think is always the one that people struggle a little bit with because they're trying to figure out and it is a pain in the ass you have to climb <laughs> up the leg of this yeah giant thing and you get your ass knocked Some off of i had to look up yeah I yeah like, I you, no, you're, I, you're, I you're like no trying to figure do. out what the hell am i supposed to do but that is the brilliance of this game is you have this expansive uh world that you're writing through that's really there's not much but there's this sense of loneliness oh my gosh yes and that's where it really hits you emotionally and that's when you know games like this is where in sometimes when you play video games um you start kind of at least for me I, you start thinking about things in your life one of the games that i used to do this was tetris you know you kind of go on like a uh you know auto autopilot a little bit and you start thinking about things in your life and things like you know conversations you had this one though man when you get out there you start thinking about i was in college at the time and i remember specifically playing this thinking about changing majors and i think i know i know what you're getting at is shadow of the colossus is a perfect example of art in its medium that it stays with you right it yeah. lingers it makes you think it makes you think for years obviously days weeks months after you finish the game but years and it's a good example of something that is still being debated to this day oh, yeah. right we see that with so many other fucking things right music and movies like what did it mean right yeah and we see that with shadow of the colossus till this day i think there's there's like a million reddit threads about this shit yeah um and that's a good, good example of how something stays with you. Mm-hmm. Now, here's another graphically artistic game that I actually never played, but I put it on the list just because I didn't know if you had played it. It's a Okami. Did that ring a bell? I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I've never played it, though. I never uh, played it, but it always looked amazing to me, and it's always been on my bucket list of things to play. It's one of those games that people always say yeah, you you should be. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll be, before I die, I will beat that game, and I'll play it, and I'll enjoy it. But since we both haven't, when neither of us have played it. I'm going to move on. Um, some other notable things I found 
was actually still in the early, I would say the very first time I teared up a little bit at uh, seeing what happened to a character uh, in a narrative and, you know, having an emotional response was in Final Fantasy IX's ending. And this was in the year 2000. Yeah. Uh, did you ever play nine? Uh, so nine is my favorite. Uh, oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So nine, you know, a lot of We're people learning a lot today. <laughs> a lot of people always go back to seven. I, and I think seven. Why? Ten is my favorite. Probably of that era, that golden era of Final Fantasy games. And I'll, we'll talk about that next. But let me hear about. Yeah, yeah let me hear I, about I, nine. Uh, I have some debates about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, we'll nine. Down. Nine is special um, because I feel like nine was like the last true final fantasy and so i still put 10 in that i say 7 to 10 was the golden age yeah and i think 9 wasn't that the last one where the the original creator the original team yeah the original team worked on but you're right that that uh ending that one is so i replayed this over the summer but yeah Yeah. i'm not going to spoil it for people on here but um, no 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 it, it, it hits it hits you pretty hard but it's like a sweet happy ending though that does occur at the end um it's but it's very bittersweet but the story to that i i i still hold that up as one of the best um in the series um absolutely it hits on some pretty deep um subjects such as and and this is why you know we're going back why this is an art medium you know again this this really hits you on you know, uh, existentialism, um, the yeah. purpose of life, um, who, what, what, what are we, what are we, or yeah, you know, what are we doing? I mean, that was one of the big things I, I didn't ever really realize until I played it again, this, you know, they're talking about taking care of the planet and stuff like that. So that, yeah, you're right. That one still to this day stays with me. The, the music and the score to that, I still think about a lot of those, those songs sometimes in my head. We, we are going to touch on just music. You know, I didn't want this episode to veer too off course. So we will talk probably a little bit of music in the gym of the week. Um, I do want to talk about 10 while we're on the subject and as much as I don't, let me premise this with, because I, I, I heard what you said under your breath. You're going to disagree with me a little bit, and that's okay. That's part of the show. Um, I'm going to get a lot of flack for that one, too. <laughs> that's okay. Do it. 10, to me, I think is powerful because we saw that graphical fidelity for the very first time where I was like, just in the, just in the um, cut scenes, obviously, where I was like, this looks like real people. Like, yeah. I'm playing a real person. Uh, obviously, it's fictional, but you can, you know, you can immerse yourself into the game world and immersion, as we've talked about previously, to the to, to the artistic elements of the medium. And even though the the story is not as good as nine and some other ones, I will agree. That's probably where I think you'll throw your flack. Um, I think the graphics and the gameplay, really the graphics and how I was able to connect to the characters created that emotional response. Yeah, the graphics in that game, I remember being so excited because, you know, Final Fantasy had kind of that reputation of having, you know, great graphics, you know, with a static background standard. Yeah, Yeah, you know, and yeah, I was blown away, too, by the graphics. I think where I I fall a little bit is that Titus was a whiny bitch. (laughs) The uh yes, I will agree with you there. The voiceover work was the Japanese voiceover work was great though. If you if you've seen, I think in the remake you can actually switch over to it. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah, but that, that I think that's a that's an artifact of a lot of things. I mean, we could talk about Breath of the Wild, but suffering from that too. Sometimes the English uh, voice acting is for those Japanese games is not on par um, with the Japanese voice acting. <sighs> Well, it's something we've seen in the West, I think, for a long time, and we didn't realize it until we had access to a lot of the original Japanese voiceover artists. Yeah. And that is, there's always this cartoonish element to them creating characters when they give it an English voiceover. Wouldn't you agree? Like there's, and it it comes off annoying, and it's that... It's the same thing they do with anime and a lot of characters where when they have a certain look to them, there's always they have they clearly have this voice in their head. Oh, in the West, when we give this an English voice, we're going to have it like this. And it's always kind of like this pre pubescent teenager voice. Right. Something like that. Yeah, I, I think it's that. I think, you know, the style too. it may fit the language and kind of the culture a little bit more. I think sometimes it's like the one thing. And I think that I saw a video of this on um, YouTube 
uh, with the most recent remake, Final Fantasy VII remake, the number of like uh, inaudible like grunting and just noises like the uh, 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 what? You well, know, that's a very things. yes, that's, that's a very, very Japanese <laughs> voiceover. <laughs> let's say technique. Yeah, when you bring in all the uhs and the uh, uh, uh what yeah. Yeah. You know, and in the West, we don't do that at all. We yeah, we, yeah. We cut that out. In fact, I think it's like shunned upon. They're yeah. like, you have too many uhs and ums, and what are they? they're called dialogue hiccups, I believe. Yeah, in yeah. the industry. But I mean, that's common in in uh, media forms. Um, but I I think it, it kind of takes out of the element, un- unless you're kind of you know that's that's why I turned on the Japanese uh, voiceover and and that Final Fantasy VII remakes because I don't know it was just it was bothering me to to a point. So <laughs> that's okay. Well, we'll we'll end with that. We, we can Final end Fantasy X. We have a whiny little bitch as yes. a main character, uh, but the game is I still think is amazing uh, and. Sounds like I didn't even know to do this, but you should probably switch over to the Japanese voiceover artist. I think a good way to end the 2000s is how we ended the 1990s, and that is with horror games. Because there's something about horror that can get a hold of you. This is a 2001 came out with Silent Hill 2, which I think is arguably the one of the greatest mm. horror games of all time. This is the ve- so Metal Gear Solid made me feel something. I was attached to the characters. Final Fantasy IX made me feel, you know, actually created the emotion in me. I got a little teary eyed. But Silent Hill Two was the first time I was legitimately scared at a game. Like I was scared to turn around a corner. I was scared to open a door because I didn't know what was lurking right behind it. Yeah, I mean, do you have something like that? I don't but uh, you know it's been so long you didn't get into horror as much as i did huh? i no, well not in the horror video games as much as you did no um but see horror movies uh, I, I we can sidetrack we can go to movies for a little bit but uh, yeah like uh heredity like okay recent example is hereditary people are telling hereditary. me hereditary scariest movie they've ever seen um, i don't know if it's the scariest movie ever i kind of was laughing at one part of it I would say the, the exorcist is yeah, ex- one of the scariest movies ever. Well, yeah, and if you were raised Catholic like I was, you, you're always that <laughs> that always freaks you out. Any type of exorcism thing. Um, Absolutely. In my Anything hometown, we kids. had a pastor or pastor or priest that would do exor- exorcisms on some people, and that always freaked me out. So yeah. <laughs> All right, I, let's pull it back. Yeah. Let's pull it back. I'm going to end the decade with um, so Silent Hill two was uh had a huge impact on me artistically as well as dead space which was essentially oh, resi yeah. resi 4 but in space but in space yeah um as we go into the 2010s i did i did make a note to myself i was doing research for this episode i wanted to talk about indie games for just a little bit sure. and that's where uh, about end of 2007 uh, and definitely through the 2010s, we saw games like Limbo and Celeste, Braid, Fez. And it was not only like indie games where like one or two people or a small team was doing stuff, but they were really pushing the, the medium to make it more artistic. Yeah. And one thing, and you're still seeing it to an extent this day, is as actually extracting like what I was trying to talk about is uh, earlier is that when you're when you're limited to the technology that you have, you you create these beautiful things. And in this case, it was sprites. And now you're seeing a lot of these indie uh, creators take that and run with it and really embrace it. So a lot of indie games, especially platformers like Celeste, uh, really hone in and um, embrace that 8-bit style that we grew up on. And Celeste is, Celeste is a fantastic game. Um, art wise it, it looks it's 8-bit graphics you know sprites things but it's beautiful in itself and then the story is is emotional i mean it's dealing with anxiety and depression and in in a game form that it's it's hard to descri- describe without kind of spoiling things but again it's another way these people have um taking taken the limits of technology but that still touched them emotionally and are now bringing it to new generations uh, of audiences and, and just knocking. We've gone, we've gone around circle, right? In a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a flat circle, man. (laughs) 
we won't go down that rabbit hole. We should though one day. Uh, let's let's move into the 2010s. On that note, and uh, this is this is another game. It's almost like an indie game. I guess it would be considered an indie game. I didn't actually play it, but I think it deserves to be on this list uh, since we're 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 focusing the conversation in such a direction. And that's Journey in 2012. Did you ever play Journey? I never played Journey. No, no. I remember. I've seen a lot of things about it, but no, I've never touched it. Okay. Well, we'll gloss over that and we'll go to something I definitely have played. So I can say a lot about, I'm not sure actually if you've played it, but it's the last of us in 2013. Yes. Fantastic. I, for me, I've, I've, you've kind of hear a thread of a thesis throughout this conversation and that there are certain elements that create an emotional response, make it artistic. And this is arguably, and I think we'll get flack for this, I don't think they <laughs> invented something revolutionary uh, in terms of gaming mechanics, but the story is so powerful, profound, uh, it hits you in the gut with emotion that it had to be on our list. We had to talk about it. Yeah, I think the late 2000s, early 2010s, or what I kind of call the blockbuster era of like... Those AAA games, and the, yeah, when they you, started calling it that, like that was a big deal. <laughs> yeah, they had been around in, in you know, story-driven games. You know, the Metal Gear series had been around. Yeah, you started seeing almost... I, you know, and I, not to be unfair, but I would say it was more strovi- story and cinematically driven than it was gameplay on some of these games. Absolutely. I, I felt like it was a decent balance, but it was definitely more leaning towards that in, in The Last of Us. Uh, the gameplay, I wouldn't say anything was was revolutionary or, yeah, like you said, technologically advancing anything. But that in like games like another Naughty Dog game, the Uncharted series, which basically became like a lot of this generation younger generations indiana jones to an extent that really focused on on the story and cinematic elements i think it really started showing people that this is not just something that people do on on nights the that when they're bored or hanging out with friends and just trying to get out some energy by going on call of duty boards and and (laughs) lobbies and just you know screaming at mindless gaming is what i call it I, i think to piggyback on your talk about existentialism just to pull it back to the last of us for a minute it was an existential tale in a lot of ways where you put yourself into the main protagonist and you say, what would you do at the end? You know, where I don't think we have to spoil that for anybody that hasn't played it yet, but uh, there is a crossroads and you have to ask yourself what you would do. So again, it, it, it makes you think about your own life, your own world, your own behaviors, who you are as a person. Can you make that decision and sacrifice everything that you have for humankind as a whole and I'll, without spoiling anything you know you kind of leave it there um it, it, it it's definitely it has a lot of heart and there's a lot of emotion i mean it, it, was, it was one of the first games i i kind of teared up in there was one there one there's one game i hope we can talk about here in a minute that made me ball like a little baby but um please no i, I want to hear it now what 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 was that one well kind of going in you know I, I was first talking about you know the balance between gameplay and cinematic storytelling um, the one game that I think in the past five years that just hit the hammers, hit the nail on the head, I mean, was God of War, the the reboot. Yes, that's on my list. <laughs> yeah, I have told people I I love this more than most movies I had seen. My wife, who is also a gamer, and I actually uh, take a backseat to watching her play games, which is fun for me. So I bought God of War right when it came out, mm-hmm. and I felt the exact same way. It was an incredible story. And she literally just finished it like a week ago. And I got to watch the entire story play out again from a backseat gamer perspective. And I was saying the same shit. I was like, this is so fucking epic. Like there were so many scenes and the the emotional uh, narrative arcs and climaxes and all these things where I was like, oh my fucking God, I forgot how epic this game was. Yeah, and and it got me interested in, in Norse mythology again. Um, yeah. Like I have a Norse mythology book and I was reading it and the fact how they could, you know, there of course there were some liberties that were made and, and some changes. It's a video game uh, taking a, um, you know, a fictional, not even, a, you know, a Greek character 
uh, in throwing them into Norse, in yeah, the Norse mythology. mythology. Um, but they really did a good job of blending that together. I mean, it, it was pretty spot on uh, for what we accept as Norse mythology today. And we can go in all of that because there's a lot of uh, background about that too. But the ending of that, that was one of the first endings that kind of gave me chills as well. Not just from an emotional side, but what is revealed. It was kind of like a twist or a plot twist that hadn't really hit me since like, I was thinking moments where movies just kind of blew me away. Like Sixth Sense, kind of like, you know, the first time I watched Empire Strikes. You really don't see it coming. Yeah, like when I was a kid and was like, what, Darth Vader looks dead? (laughs) And then like, um, yeah, Sixth Sense. Um, Another one was A Beautiful Mind because I had no idea what the movie was about or about John Nash and all. That, That was another time where I'm like, you know, holy, holy shit. Oh, this is what you're trying to show. Oh my God. And it like clicks and you're like, Oh my God, this is amazing. You're setting up this huge ass event throughout this whole game. Uh, a fight club just popped in my head. Fight club is another one, but they're setting up this gigantic thing through the arc of this beautiful story about a father and son who don't really see eye to eye that are just trying to take his mother, his wife's ashes to the highest mountaintop in all of the realms. Yes. To round out the rest of the 2010s, uh, I know you're not a big uh, RE guy, but RE7, I think, was a return to form, very scary uh, first-person view game. Yeah. Check it out if you haven't done so already. And then uh, I think to round out the circle is uh, MGS5, Metal Gear Solid Five. Ooh, yeah. Which had more of an emphasis on... I, I would say the gameplay and mechanics than the story that that's where it, it to me, it, it took a, a, a concept and kind of a, gen, a genre, a game that was getting pretty bland and long in the tooth and totally threw it on its head. Exactly. Um, and that's, and it cool. got <laughs> talk about that fucking fan base. Like for <laughs> years, they, that that's what they bitched about. Right. Yeah. They're like we want more of, x y and z instead of one two and three and then they're like okay we'll give it to you by still pushing the medium and then they're and then they go now we want the old thing again fuck like it's it was impossible to please everyone but i think as a as an artistic thing the graphics are amazing the story i think for what they could complete uh, oh i I still am very defensive of it because games game content gets cut all the time Mm -hmm. And we just don't hear about it. But there was this huge fucking Konami versus Kojima, um, very public, you know, Nasty. schism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it, something you, you don't really see a lot from Japanese co- companies either. Um, right. Usually they, they keep me just working in this, you know, the business world and working with a lot of Japanese companies. You, you never see this kind of stuff. And it was it was what they did to him was bad <laughs> let's just put it that way it was it was think, unprofessional it was it was dirty and we'll i think we'll end the 2010s on that and maybe a little bit of a wink to anybody listening out there that yes we are definitely going to have an entire episode on kojima and his legacy as an auteur but we wanted just to focus on the history of art and gaming because we both know that this has a completely changed from the birth of the industry to what it is today and i think we're gonna i think i thought a a really good way to close out this conversation and discussion on this and look forward to the the rest of the decade and with that we know there's amazing games coming up what are you excited for mr t-buck well you know my uh, you know at this point i thought i would be playing cyberpunk 2077 and oh riding riding the you know night city I bought it too, and I'm waiting for every patch they can possibly yeah, get. I'm, I haven't even, I have not played one single second of it yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm holding off a little bit um, for that. I, you know, there's not a lot of things on the horizon. Uh, well, no pun intended. Horizon, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Zero Dawn, Zero Dawn or, uh, Forbidden West. Or Forbidden West is it's something I'm looking for. I'm still holding out hope that we'll have a Metroid Prime 4 come out this year. Ooh, that's, man, we're really going to bring this conversation to a cir- to a, a fine circle and closure because that's going to be part of the gem of the week is the Metroid series. Oh, okay. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, I do want to touch on Forbidden West for a minute. Uh, I actually didn't like Horizon Zero Dawn. I thought it was... I don't I don't want to be one of those 
reviewers or podcasters that just shits on stuff. I just I know it was very I think I could see why a lot of people liked it. I didn't truly care for it. And I will be buying the game for my wife because yeah. <laughs> she loved it. So uh, with with that, we are going to, I think, uh, close and say that we're very excited for the future of gaming and all of its artistic pursuits, its expansions, its evolutions. I think we're only going to be seeing it uh, explode into amazing different journeys and sights and emotions. And it, I think any listeners out there that are gamers or non-gamers, it doesn't matter. The video game industry as an artistic medium deserves your attention. And even if you just have to buy the fucking concept art for some game that you like, because you like, uh, you know, maybe the creature designs or the character designs, there's something for everyone in the art world. Check it out. So thank you for listening. But before we go, what we like to do is give you what you've been hearing all damn discussion. That's the gym of the week. A little icing on top where we like to talk about either something that has everything to do with the discussion. If we can, sometimes this is something we're really into in the last week and we want to tell you about it. So it's like an even deeper cut. Uh, anybody that wants to dig deep into some more rabbit holes. And as I said, I wanted to bring the uh, uh, the discussion round circle as uh, I just dusted off and finished Super Metroid yesterday. This is um, early 90s Super Nintendo. It's it's the very first time that I was obsessed with the soundtrack game design. It has no story, really. I mean, it has it does it has a very thin, thinly veiled story. But, um, you know, it doesn't I don't think artistically it doesn't hit me emotionally as the, some of the other stuff we talked about. But it's just core game design, core elements of a lot of different things, especially for a Metroidvania. If you were into that, this is one for the absolute books. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Mr. t Yeah, so uh, thinking about Hidden Gems, I'm going to say this is necessarily kind of like yours. It's obviously known, but I think, you know, one game that you should really look into is uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Um, and it's no, just, I, I played that. My wife played that. Or my wife was just, just talking about that yesterday, yeah. too. I mean, it's it's no longer canon. It is a classic, though. It is probably one of my favorite Star Wars stories, um, and it's and it's one of the best RPGs ever made. So take a look at it, enjoy it. Um, they are pulling a lot of stuff from the old video games and some of the legends into like the Mandalorian and things like that. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we get some old Republic Star Wars Shit content back, yeah. in the future. So I I. I'm absolutely in love with the Mandalorian right now. And so I, if they can tie that into Knights or have bring their it, own, bring it on. I would love to see a Dave Filoni led Knights of the old Republic. Absolutely. Series. Yeah. You, you do that and, and I will die a happy <laughs> man. So. Very good. Well, hopefully uh, we could all die happy men and women if we get, get things like that. Um, Thank you so much for listening, everyone. You can follow us at underscore Novo underscore day or at Novo Day Media, as well as follow us at our site, NovoDayProductions.com. If you liked any of that, any of the stuff we talked about, you may also like some of our work. You can purchase the Entropy Sessions, Adulteration, and Post Meridium, and much, much more on our site. Again, NovoDayProductions.com. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow, and go ahead and hit that notification bell. And if you'd like to sponsor our little love child here, you can reach out to us, our HR division, at novodaymedia at gmail.com. That's N-O-V-O-D-E media at gmail.com. We'll see you next time, guys. Be good to each other, and as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions, created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media, at Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company, Facebook.com slash Aco Music 123, Aco on Spotify. Logo design by Tom Justice, J E S T U S, of the Justice and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved.